We often speak of Apollo as a single, monolithic journey, a flight from one world to another. But that's a convenient fiction we tell ourselves to make sense of the incomprehensible. The reality, the technical and emotional truth of it, was a brutal, beautiful dissection. A journey broken into a dozen discreet, unforgiving steps. And at the heart of that dissection, at the very core of Apollo's audacity, was an object that looked less like a spaceship and more like an insect of improbable geometry. It was the lunar module, and its story is one of magnificence, almost reckless engineering. In the public imagination, the Saturn V was the hero, a titan of fire and sound that shook the very ground of Cape Kennedy. And the command and service modules, the sleek, bullet-shaped spacecraft, were the vessel of return, the lifeboat that brought the men home. They were the familiar. The lunar module, or LM, was something else entirely. It was the only Apollo craft designed exclusively for lunar orbit and surface operations, never intended to return through Earth's atmosphere. Its story isn't one of glory and thrust, but of vulnerability and quiet genius. It was the fragile masterpiece. The challenge of the Apollo program was deceptively simple. Get to the moon and come back. But the devil, as always, was in the details. The first and most profound detail was weight. Every kilogram, every pound of mass had to be launched from Earth's gravity well, and every bit of that mass required an exponential increase in the rocket's size. The engineers at Grumman Aircraft who were tasked with building the LM, were given a seemingly impossible directive. Build a two-person spacecraft capable of a powered descent to the lunar surface and a subsequent powered ascent, all while remaining as light as possible. The initial design target was under 15,000 kilograms, or 33,000 pounds, though later LMs with heavier equipment like the lunar rover grew closer to 16,500 kilograms, or 36,500 pounds. Think about that. The command module was a pressure vessel. It was sleek, a beautiful aerodynamic form designed to cut through the atmosphere. The LM had no such constraints. It was designed solely for the vacuum of space. This freedom from conventional design, from the need for a nose cone or wings, led to its bizarre alien appearance. It was a pure functional machine. A collection of pressurized tanks, thrusters, and instruments wrapped in a thin layer of multi-layer insulation, MLI the famous gold foil that acted as its thermal skin. The pressure hull of the crew cabin was so thin, in fact, that an astronaut could dent it with his elbow. The entire structure was a lightweight lattice of aluminum beams, a space frame built to withstand the loads of docking and lunar operations, protected from the crushing G-forces of launch inside the Saturn V's adapter. The LM was not just a vehicle, it was two separate spacecraft in one, the descent stage and the ascent stage. The descent stage was the foundation. It housed the main descent engine, a powerful, throttleable rocket designed to be the brake for the moon's gravity. It carried the fuel and oxidizer tanks, the landing gear, and most critically, the scientific instruments and the Lunar Rover, or LRV, on later missions. It was a massive piece of hardware, a base that would be left behind, a tombstone on the lunar surface. The ascent stage, perched atop the descent stage like a pilot fish on a whale, was the heart of the mission. It was the crew compartment, the home for two men, with a separate ascent engine 
the navigational computers, and the communications equipment. Its entire purpose was to lift off from the moon, rendezvous with the command module orbiting above, and deliver the crew back to the safety of their return vehicle. This division of labor, this ruthless optimization, was the only way they could meet the weight constraints. The most critical and terrifying phase of the mission was the powered descent. This was the moment of truth. The LM would undock from the command module and descend into the blackness below. The descent engine, a marvel of engineering in its own right, was the key. It wasn't a simple rocket, it was a throttling engine, adjustable from about 10% to 60% thrust. The pilot had a joystick, a hand controller that could change the thrust to counteract a gravity well that was pulling the LM at an ever-increasing speed. The onboard computer, the Apollo Guidance Computer, AGC, was the co-pilot. Its memory was tiny by modern standards, just 76 kilobytes of ROM and 2 kilobytes of RAM. But for its time, it was revolutionary. It was programmed for a precision that was beyond human capability, but it could not handle the unknown. The pilot, the human in the loop, was the essential variable. He had to look out the window at the lunar terrain and make decisions in real time. Think of the stakes. The LM began its powered descent from lunar orbit, traveling at roughly 1.6 kilometers or one mile per second. The descent engine's job was to kill that horizontal velocity and slowly ease the spacecraft down. Near the surface, the descent rate was just a few meters or feet per second. The AGC was guiding the ship to a pre-planned landing spot, but it had no idea what was on the ground. A boulder, a crater, a steep slope, any one of these could spell disaster. On Apollo 11, the LM, named Eagle, was heading for a landing zone pocked with craters and large boulders. The guidance computer, overloaded with radar data, started spitting out a now famous series of alarms, the 1201 and 1202 alarms. To a less experienced crew, this would have been a heart-stopping moment. But Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were not just pilots, they were engineers, and they had trained for this. In Mission Control, Guidance Officer Steve Bales made the crucial call. We're go on that. He knew the alarms meant the computer was busy, not failing. Armstrong took control. He flew the LM manually, looking for a clear spot, a patch of smooth ground. He was flying with only a small window and his instruments, and with the fuel gauge dropping at an alarming rate. With just 20 seconds of fuel left, a voice from Mission Control, the calm and steady voice of Charlie Duke, crackled over the comms. 30 seconds. This was the final call, the last moment before they had to abort. But Armstrong found his spot. He feathered the throttle, brought the LM to a hover, and slowly, deliberately, lowered it to the surface. Three of the four foot pads, each with a long probe, touched the ground. A light on the instrument panel lit up. Contact light. Then, engine stop. The silence that followed was the silence of a new world. They had done it. Against all odds, the fragile, beautiful machine had delivered them. The lunar module's design was a masterpiece of simplicity and redundancy. But there was one part that was a pure, unadulterated gamble, the ascent engine. There was no redundant ascent engine. There was no second chance. It had to fire, 
and it had to work perfectly. Think about the psychological weight of that. The ascent stage was their only way home. It was a small rocket motor, a cylinder of metal and wires standing between them and a lonely death on the moon. This engine had to ignite flawlessly in the vacuum at a moment when they were at their most emotionally drained and physically exhausted. The engine was a single-chambered, hypergolic propellant engine. It had no turbo pumps, no complex machinery. It was simple by design, which made it more reliable. You turned a valve, and the hypergolic propellants, which ignite on contact, flowed into the chamber. The rocket fired. There was no second try. This was the ultimate one-shot deal. On Apollo 11, the moment came for liftoff. After more than 21 hours on the surface, the Eagle was ready to fly. Aldrin, calm and collected, called out the countdown. Armstrong, with his hand on the abort button, a final grim failsafe, watched the instruments. Guidance. Control. Proceed. Armstrong confirmed. And with a gentle tug, the ascent engine fired. There was no sharp jolt, no violent concussive sound, just a gradual, smooth push as the ascent stage, with its two occupants, lifted slowly from the lunar plane. They rose into the blackness, propelled by the same technology that had brought them to their knees just a day before. The LM was a machine of a hundred impossible choices. It was a vehicle designed to be ugly, to be a pure function of its purpose. It had no graceful curves, no sleek lines, but its beauty was in its uncompromising honesty. It was a machine that said, I am here to do one thing and one thing only. After rendezvous and docking with the command module, the LM's final act was a silent one. It was jettisoned, cast off into the void. Its ascent stages long gone, their crashes recorded by seismometers, while its descent stages remain on the moon's surface as silent monuments. The story of the lunar module isn't just about a machine. It's about a philosophy of engineering. It's about a group of brilliant, tireless people who were given an impossible problem and who solved it by throwing out the rulebook. They built a machine not for beauty, not for glory, but for survival. They built it to be lean, to be fragile, to be a pure expression of its mission. The Apollo Lunar Module was the most complex, yet in many ways the most beautiful, piece of engineering in the program. It was the moment of truth, the point of no return. It was the machine that truly went to the moon. And in its vulnerable, magnificent form, it carried with it the hopes of an entire planet. It was the fragile masterpiece that made the impossible possible.